No doubt I think there are several words which can be used to describe Irene, and one of those words is determined. As was said a little bit ago, it was just a Sunday before last that, that Irene came to both our small group Sunday school, our Sunday school time as well as the morning service here at Mount Auburn. And if anyone had a reason to not come that day, Irene did. But from what I know of, about Irene's life, this was typical of her commitment not only to the work of the body of believers here at Mount Auburn, but also just to the cause of Christ. Just a few weeks ago, when Irene was no longer able to, to help Sandy at Trinity Lutheran, uh, Sandy, I guess she probably told you to bring paper because she was still going to help great anyway. I know visiting in the home, she'd be sitting there and she'd be grading papers and, and you'd have to interrupt her if you were going to talk to her because she had other things to be able to do there. And then about a month ago, uh, you guys put on the annual uh, garage yard sale uh, out here in, in the Outreach Center. And uh, from what I could tell, Irene was still as involved as she could be in that as you were raising money for Relay for Life. This is something I understand that Irene has done forever. This is how she lived her past few weeks. And to further demonstrate her determined lifestyle, as we've already said, how many people do you know who have 150 uh, foster kids? And I think the other thing that, that, that I'll not forget was here just two or three weeks ago, she told us, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but she told us that she had helped 17 ladies plan their weddings. And for those of us who have been involved in planning one wedding, that's enough, if you know what I mean. But 17, does, is that correct? Do you all know that story? <laughs> that's the number that I remember hearing, and my wife remembers that as well. Irene was certainly determined to live her life to the fullest, and I think she did, don't you? And uh, as a matter of fact, Sandy, there was, some, there was one story, I don't know if I could tell it as well as you did, that you left out about her not being very compliant with the police officer in Crothersville. <laughs> <laughs> she was late for choir practice, she ran a stop sign, and the way it was written, she even went on two wheels a couple times and got her getting there. Policeman chased her to the church. <laughs> she got out and basically didn't pay attention to me. She said she was late for choir practice <laughs> and just walked on. <laughs> what could you do? <laughs> that would be our <laughs> I think there's another word that describes her life, and that is the word faithful. She was faithful in life until her death. Why? What was her motivation for living faithfully as a follower of Jesus? Well, I think there's several, several ways of being able to answer those questions. Number one, she knew that the life that she had was a gift from God. After all, the Bible says that it's through Him that we live and move and, and have our very being. She knew that, that sin was an experience in life and that we were all in need of a Savior. And she knew that God and so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Jesus to come to earth so that we might not only be able to see who God is and so that we might have a model for us as to how to live our lives. We also know that Jesus came to go to that old rugged cross and to become our redeemer, which he willingly did as he became that perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. She knew that whoever believes in him by living faithfully for him as a way of life would not perish, but have everlasting life. She believed the words of Jesus whenever he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And if you may recall, after Jesus said these words, he asked an important question, do you believe this? And today, I believe that if Irene were here, she would be telling me to ask you, do you believe all these things that Jesus has said? And then I think she would ask another question, are you living what you believe? Faithful in life unto death was demonstrated by her commitment to her God, to the work of the body of Christ, the church, to her husband, to her family, and to all who knew her. And really, quite frankly, when we talk about this business of faithfulness, this 
describes why followers of Jesus are ready when it comes time to leave this life and to go to be with the Lord. Why is it, though, that we believe as followers of Jesus that we can be ready for death? Well, from the inspired writings of Paul, we find these words. Paul proclaimed that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a reality when he wrote to the church at Corinth about 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And he said, if you don't believe it, there's many people who are still yet living who will testify to that fact. And of course, there was the lives that were changed as a result of that resurrection. And then when we think about what it means for believers to believe in the resurrection, we know that it means our lives are changed. Changed now, and they're going to be changed at the resurrection whenever that occurs. Because then we will be able to put on a new body that will never have sickness, nor will ever die. And that new body will enable us to be able to be in heaven, to live in the very presence of God forever. And to top it all off, after Paul defended and spoke about what the resurrection was all about, he left that chapter 15 with this simple challenge. He said, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's that kind of conviction. It's that kind of challenge that we allow ourselves to be a part of that enables us to be ready whenever it comes time to die. As I just said, life is a time whenever sin is a part of this life and that we are in need of forgiveness, when we can be forgiven as born-again believers, and that causes us to have every reason to stand firm and to always give ourselves fully to the word of the Lord because of what he has done for us. It's the least that we can do in saying thank you for all that he has done for us. We can also live this way of being faithful because we lay claim to the promises that we find from God's word, which, again, the inspired, inspired Apostle Paul wrote whenever he said, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. In another letter that, that Paul wrote, and by the time when he wrote these words, he was in a prison cell for his faith. He just simply said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There's a story about a man who was facing his death, and he was asked what he thought about this imminent death that he was facing, and his reply was simple. He says, it matters little to me whether I live or die. If I die, I will be with Jesus, and if I live, Jesus will be with me. You see, he laid claim to these promises that we have from God's Word. These are similar words that I have heard Irene say. And here just lately, as she was sitting in her chair, whenever she took a break from grading papers, and um, as she as we visited with her in her living room. And as I knew Irene, you know, as, we, as already has been said, you didn't have to wonder what she was thinking. And you didn't even have to ask. She'd just tell you. And I liked that about her. And I think probably you did too, those of you that knew her. You remember the name Cassie Bernal? The teenager that was killed in the Columbine High School tragedy back in 1999. You may recall, if you think back at that particular time, that, that there was her parents found a, a sentence underlined in the book that, that she had read, and it just simply said this, all of us should live our life so as to be able to face eternity at any time. Uh, I think Irene felt like this. She talked like this. And therefore, we can rejoice that she was prepared when that time comes. To sum up her life, we can go to the words of Jesus found in 
the book of Revelation, in one of the letters written to the seven churches, in particular the church at Smyrna, where Jesus said, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. And one of the neat things about what we see, not in the English language, but in the original language that the New Testament was written in, is that word that's translated crown means the victor's crown, it's the Stephanos crown, it's the crown once received, which can never be taken away. It is not the diadem crown, the king's crown. A king can be dethroned, but whenever you receive the victor's crown, it's yours forever. And that's what we receive according to God's word, whenever we are faithful, even to the point of death. So that brings us down to this. Life is a time for decision, just as God's word said, just as man is destined to die once after that, we face the judgment. And we ask ourselves the question, what is our life? And we realize the answer from God's word is that life is just a mist, it's just a vapor that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. And for those of us who decide to follow Lord Jesus, we will find ourselves being able to say, as Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, these words, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that, that Jesus died and that he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we are left, or who are left, Till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first and after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage, comfort each other with these words. I just want to refer back to one little phrase that I read there, asleep in Jesus. It's almost Memorial Day, isn't it? I can remember as a kid when I still lived at home. I haven't lived at home now for about 40 years, 40 plus years. But when I was home, we would visit the cemetery and we would probably spend a half a day there visiting graves. And after a while, you just need to get out and walk a little bit because you run out of something to do if you stay in one place. And I can remember seeing the grave sites of children. This is what made me think about it, her love for children, okay? When you see a gravestone from years back that is where a child is buried, a lot of times you will just simply see the phrase, asleep in Jesus. It seemed to be a favorite, a favorite phrase for people to put on a stone for that of a child. Uh, asleep in Jesus. That just simply means to be with Jesus. From the book of Revelation, for those who have chosen to follow Jesus, we can read this and count on it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who has he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And in the beginning of the 22nd chapter of Revelation, as we end this section here which talks about heaven, we find these words. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing down from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. I want to stop there for just a moment. This is one of my favorite phrases in all of God's Word, especially because of the promise that it gives us about heaven. His servants will serve Him. That tells me that we who are followers of Jesus in heaven are going to be busy and not bored. I can't wait. How about you? Okay? <laughs> they will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God, the spirits, and the prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. That's what we've just read about. I believe that's also the reason why God's word tells us that for the sake of believers, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Let me close with just this little reading entitled Life's Book. You may have seen it or heard it at one time. No matter what else you are doing from cradle days through to the end, you are writing your life's secret story. Each day sees another page penned. Each month writes a 30-page chapter. Each year means the end of a part. And never an act is misstated or even one wish of the heart. Each day when you wake, the book opens, revealing a page clean and white, what thoughts and words and what doings will cover its pages by night. God leaves that to you. You're the writer. And never a word shall grow dim till the day you write the words finished and give back your life's book to Him. The challenge that I want to leave with you is just simply this. And I believe it's, I think I really would say it like this. Will you live your life knowing that it's a gift from God? And will you be sure that you've accepted that redemption that has been purchased for us through Jesus on that old rugged cross? And then will you live your life knowing that now is the time to decide, now is the time to live, because we just do not know when it will come our time to go be with Jesus. Father, thank you for the life and the example that we have seen in our apostate. We realize that you have shown us how to live through Jesus. You have shown us how to live through others down through the ages. And you've shown us how we can live even through